To answer that, first let's look at what you actually need for a full node. At the very least, it's a Raspberry Pi, 8 gigabytes of RAM, 2 terabytes of storage, 1 terabyte a month internet, and a like client is basically anything that doesn't support those specs, like a browser wallet to the left side, MetaMask, or in the center, the status, mobile, or on the right, hardware wallet. So let's look at what those like clients can actually do. Let's assume that you own one of those, this MetaMask wallet with the 4.75 ETH, and you are doing great work at this conference, and your work is so great that you are approached by investors. Here, someone approaches you, he wants to donate 0.5 ETH to you. So, sounds good, 0.5 ETH, a lot of money. You give them the QR code, they send the money, and they send you the transaction, and so it seems good, but when you check it, you see, ah, oh, they accidentally sent 5 ETH. So, we need to refund 4.5 of those, and luckily we brought our hardware wallet, but as you know, the Wi-Fi is not too great here, so let's just ask if we can use their laptop. And they agree, we connect the ledger to their laptop, and we see here the 9.75 ETH, so the plus 5, and we sign the transaction for 4.5. The ledger protects our keys so they cannot be extracted. Um, we see here the amount is correct, the address is correct, and we confirm and we thank them for the donation. So, like clients very powerful, but there is a problem. When you go back to the hotel, you actually realize that uh, this transaction of the 5 ETH is missing. So, what went wrong? We confirmed that everything is correct, but uh, one key piece is missing there. The actual balance was 4.75 ETH, so they lied to us with the 9.75. This is actually the same problem with traditional banking. When I create a transaction to an unknown destination, they only ask me if the amount correct and the address, but they don't verify that the intent why I am sending the tra transaction is really why. Um, yeah. So where is MetaMask putting this data from? The answer is, there is a setting in there, and you just put it to a server. By default, that's in Fura, but in this case, the scammer just put a custom URL there that lies about the balance. So, how is that possible? Isn't that more secure? Um, actually, it's just, this is the call that MetaMask is doing. ETH get balance, you pass it the address, the block number, and in the response, you just get the raw balance. No security, not so ever, just trust me, bro. So, in this case, the attacker simply added the 5 ETH. If it's our address, this is the complete attack code, the thing I tried with a real MetaMask. So, now the question is, how can we make this more secure? To understand that, we need to, understand, uh, we need to see what, are, what is actually stored on Ethereum. And all of these things, any one of you probably interacted with at least one of them, NFT ownership, game characters, tokenized assets, exchange rates, or even just the plain ETH balance that we have seen before. All of that is just data stored as part of the Ethereum state. And because it's data, it's just a bunch of bytes, and we can arrange it as we want. For example, here, we can order it. And then what we can do is we can compute the hash function on pairs of each of them. So a hash function is just a one-way function. It's a cryptographic checksum. The idea is that if any of these change, for example, if someone modifies the B, then the hash also changes. And we can apply this to the entire data. And as you can see here, we now have only four of them. Then we do it again. We only have two of them until we have a single state root hash. So how is this useful? If we have our balance down here, the 4.75, we can see the root hash contains information about all of it. So whenever someone changes that, for example, to 9.75 to lie to us, everything changes up to that root hash. So if we know the correct root hash, we can know that um, whether something was tampered with or not. So how do we actually send 
a proof that the 4.75 ETH was used as part of this hash. And for this, we need to walk this entire path to the top. Let's start with this node here. Um, to compute that, we also need this one. And then we go to the next uh, node here. And for that one, we need the A and B. And then from there, we go all the way to the top. What is missing is EFG and H. So with just sending those three additional values, we can prove that the 4.75 is part of the root hash. We can cut away all of the rest. So those proofs are really tiny. Of course, in reality, it's not just a binary Merkle tree. Um, it's a bit more complex, but the general principle is the same. So how do we obtain those proofs? The answer is is get proof. The interface looks surprisingly similar to the get balance, but instead of just a balance in the response, we also receive the Merkle proof. And this Merkle proof can be used to verify that the balance that we get is indeed part of that root hash. So now the question is, how do we obtain the root hash? Um, this is where the like client protocol comes in. If we look at the beacon chain, it's a series of blocks that point to the parent block with a address that's part of the block. It forms a chain. And since the merge, actually, um, the root hash is just part of those blocks. So the question now is, how do we obtain that latest block with the correct root hash? And a full node does this by just following all the signatures and verifying them. We have the proposer of each block and then all the attestations. But to verify that, it's like nearly half a million of validator keys, and it takes multiple gigabytes to verify what is the latest block. So that is not very practical for like clients. But a year ago, Altair launched, and it added this notion of a sync committee. A sync committee is a set of just 512 validators that the like client can keep track of. And they also sign each block. They sign whatever is the latest block. And if you know those keys, you verify the signature. And more than 2 thirds of it agreed on the same block, you can trust that it's the same, um, that is correct. So how do you get these sync committees? And the answer here is it's from the previous sync committee. Every day, the sync committee changes. And the previous sync committee signs a message that passes on this power of signing the latest block to the next sync committee. And the previous sync committee, how do you get that one? It's from the previous, previous sync committee, of course. But at some point, you just need to agree on a trusted block route, for example, the merge transition block. And if you start from there with the initial sync committee, um, you can get that with a Merkle proof as a bootstrap object. And from there, you can uh, continue and continue one day at a time to the next sync committee, um, download those public keys, verify the message that signs the next sync committee until you are at the present one. And then you obtain the latest block, check the signature, and you know the root hash. This data is really small. It's just about 25 kilobytes each. And to obtain the final uh, root hash, it's just about 300 bytes. Um, one thing for certain applications that can be done, if you are really offline for a long time, those committee messages can be combined into a CK proof. And then you can essentially jump from any point in time to the present in constant time with a very small proof. Those APIs um, are available to download the data. It's on REST and lib 2 p It's already standardized, part of the official specs. On the portal network, there is a PR. And Lodestar and Nimbus are currently implementing the lib P2P and REST APIs. So if you want to try those, feel free to do so. Then security, how secure is it? There is some research that shows that with a few minor modifications to the protocol, it can be made um, so that you can actually only sync every four months. So this really opens up a lot of applications. Uh, such as IoT devices where you um, are not connected to the internet. So as long as you sync once every four months, should be secure. Then let's bring it 
better. This was where we started. We had our wallet just get balance to Infura, and it returned us the 4.75 ETH. Um, not very secure, but uh, it's, it's the best that could be done before the merge. Now we can obtain the latest root hash from the Beacon API and then use the get proof endpoint to actually get the 4.75 plus a proof that it is actually part of the root hash that we obtained. And this essentially means that if you think that the Beacon API provider could be the same as the Web3 API provider, why not? Infura could essentially just provide that data, and you no longer have to trust them for the correctness of the data, but just for the availability of the data. That is quite huge. If you don't want to modify MetaMask, you can also put a proxy in between that does this translation. So MetaMask is unmodified. It still does this old get balance call, but the verifying proxy, it keeps track of the latest root hash using the light client data, and it translates the get balance call to the get proof and verifies that the returned data is correct. It can alert you if it was tampered with, like in our original case. This verifying proxy is available today from Nimbus. Um, it's, it, it's a part of the Nimbus ETH1 repo in the LC underscore proxy subfolder. And yesterday, someone announced on Discord ETH R&D in the Light Clients channel a product called Kevlar that also does this, um, including proof verification for NFT ownership and uh, token balances. So one piece is still missing for the ledger device. How can we get it to show us the current balance? Of course, that needs a modification to the ledger software, but it could be done in a way where we just dump all of this data to the ledger, and it can actually just verify that it's correct. It, it uses the live client data to update to the latest public keys, then obtains the latest true hash, then verifies that the balance that we give it is correct using the Merkle proof, and then it can show this. It can show the balance with the timestamp, and you can verify that this transaction is really something you want to do. So what else can we do with this protocol? Um, for full nodes, right now it's always a bit tricky. Where do you obtain that initial state from? Usually you just go to Infura and grab states finalized. And then maybe you go to Beacon Chain and check that it's a correct one. But uh, with this protocol, you can just hard code the merge transition block, for example, into the client, and then use the like client protocol to jump to the latest state, download that state, and then use that as your bootstrap checkpoint without having to validate it against Beacon Chain. Or another use case, a decentralized wallet that doesn't need to talk to any server. Geth has a mode called LES. Currently, it's sort of a thing that you have to enable, but um, the key point is that it doesn't require a huge database. So what the Light Client protocol gives you is access to the block headers, and inside of the execution payload header, there is a field called logs bloom. And with that field, you can filter all the incoming transactions and uh, see whether a block contains a transaction that is interesting for your wallet. So you just need like the little like client on the consensus side, 25 kilobytes a day, about tw um, 20 bytes per second to follow the blocks continuously. And then you can pass the headers over to guess LES, and it can then filter for the blocks that contain interesting transactions and just download those few blocks. It's not every block for sure. So. If we go a bit farther to the future, layer twos are getting more important. And for them, the problem right now is they get hacked all the time. Like, they usually get operated by Oracle nodes that are trusted. There is a multi-sig, maybe five out of nine, four out of seven. But it turns out that one party owns four of those. So when they get compromised, everything gets hacked. And if you add this like client protocol there, um, it can sort of act as an additional safety net so that the Oracle nodes cannot just 
um, send the bogus information. So for example, when you make a deposit into a bridge, you can create a Merkle proof that you made that deposit in the Ethereum state. And if there is a light client deployed to that layer two, you can then use this as, a, as an endpoint. Like if you, if you submit a Merkle proof to that bridge, um, it can verify using that light client that it's a valid deposit and can transfer that tokens to the layer two. And also, Internet of Things devices, you can put a rental pass for bicycles in your wallet on chain, like a weekly pass, and you can just send this data to the bicycle lock, like we have seen with the ledger device before. And it can actually verify that you own that uh, rental pass and are allowed to open that lock. Or for example, when you have like an electric car charger at home and you want your friends to be able to use it, but not anyone to be able to use it, just put a light client on there. It doesn't need to be connected to the internet. So yeah, that's uh, all from my side. This is the latest updates about the light client protocols. Um, feel free to contribute to this Discord channel from ESR and D. Um, this is where we discuss the light clients. We also have time for questions, if anyone has a question. Hello, uh, thank you for the great talk. Um, I see a lot of FUD from Bitcoin maxis who say that it's putting too much pressure on the nodes while you're part of the sync committee. Um, so I just wanted to ask, what do the resources of the machine look like while you're part of a sync committee, CPU, RAM, and bandwidth? So as part of the sync committee, you are already um, doing extra work. So doing this extra like client work is actually not that much extra. Um, basically, what you need to do is you need to hash the state, and you need to grab a bit of static data out of it. Um, because you already loaded the state, um, getting those hashes is basically instantaneous. So this uh, really just doesn't add that much. Um, for Nimbus, we collect the like client data by default, and no one has ever complained about any CPU spike or bandwidth spike due to that. Can you please elaborate on what this means for wallets, uh, like MetaMask or Coinbase or Ledger? Uh, like, what does this actually, what's the future opportunity of using light clients and how does that change um, how wallets actually operate in the future? Um, I'm not sure if I got the question, but uh, MetaMask right now, it has to use the get balance endpoint because that's just what was available before the merge. With this, it can actually provide a secure, verified um, display, so to say, so that, the dis uh, so that the balance that it shows is actually correct. Um, also for your NFT balances, NFT ownership, anything can be verified. Is there anything the protocol can do to be even friendlier to light clients, or are we pretty much as good as it will get? We are still working on the protocol. For example, right now getting access to the execution payload header is not that easy. You, need, you still need to download the full block for that. But uh, we are targeting a couple improvements there for Capella that further reduce the amount of information that needs to be exchanged to be fully um, synced to the latest head. Oh, hey, uh, thanks for the talk. I just have a question about the attack that you showed at the beginning with MetaMask and the solution that you uh, came up with at Nimbus as how to mitigate that attack. I'm just curious, um, and for use my, uh, excuse my ignorance uh, here on this question, but like, why di doesn't MetaMask or these like, client wallet providers just build a solution um, and instantiate it themselves? Like, what does... Um, Nimbus, why does Nimbus need to be brought in to mitigate this attack? Well, the reason there is that actually those protocols just are getting standardized right now. For example, the REST protocol was standardized on Monday. So that's when it got merged. So there was just not enough time yet. 
and we hope for sure that MetaMask and Ledger will integrate those security enhancements directly into their products. Or you could also imagine a scenario where Apple and Google put it into the Android and iOS um, operating systems as a background service. So you can just ask that one, give me a secure balance. And as long as you trust that background process, um, that's fine. Um, but yeah, the answer is uh, just there was not enough time yet to implement those changes because the protocols are really brand new. Hey, Zan, what are the um, sort of assumptions that are being made or the security implications of just trusting the data that comes into the light client headers and how do we mitigate this? So all of the security uh, implications, um, the string committee is sampled by random from the full validator set. So the full beacon chain currently operates under an honest majority assumption. So as long as a majority is honest, the beacon chain works. So if we sample randomly 512 validators from that set that is considered to be honest majority, then the same can be assumed for the smaller set. And there is also this additional safety, that's why it's more than the week's objectivity period, um, where because like, it has to be exactly those 512 validators that are only assigned for that particular day that you need to compromise, if you look at it, how long does it take for um, validators to exit? It takes about four months until enough validators are exited so that they can then sign conflicting histories um, to compromise this. So as long as you stay within the four months, and as long as we uh, improve the protocol with those slashing methods, then uh, I think it's quite a secure way. What you have to keep in mind, though, is that the string committee is 512 validators, and each of them has 32 ETH. So if you combine all of these balances, it's about $2 million. So that's about the highest cost you can get. Even if everyone would be fully slashed down to zero, um, any attacker who can offer the string committee a higher amount than that can compromise this. Um, so right now, for highly secure applications such as layer two bridges, I would recommend it as an additional safety net. So in case the Oracle nodes get compromised, that you can still verify that they are compromised. Um, but uh, I would not trust this solely for high security. For the wallet use cases, it's already an improvement compared to just trusting in Fura. Hey, uh, so on the beginning of the talk, you mentioned this Raspberry Pi 4 with uh, 8 gigs and 2 terabytes of disk. So is that still the, the same for like a running light client? Could be a bit lower to smaller devices running Linux in constraint like a hardware uh, resources? A light client doesn't need a database. You just uh, have to track those 512 validator public keys and the latest header. So you don't need eight gigabytes of RAM. You don't need two terabytes of storage because there is no database. And you only need 20 bytes a second over one terabyte a month. So yeah. Awesome. So please, one more round of applause for Ethan.